Just let me know when we're back up. Yep, we're there. Excellent, thank you. Welcome back everyone. And uh, to those people that were trying to get into this meeting, I'll just um, reiterate, you are more than welcome to watch us on uh, our, our YouTube channel, but um, for the purposes of this meeting, we are at the portion of the agenda that is comments and questions from council. Uh, and I wanted uh, council to have some time uh, so that we can uh, we can suss some of this stuff out. I just uh, wanted to make a few um, notes before we get started. I um, I'm I'm really sorry that uh, some of these letters uh, got so personal. Um, I think it's a shame. I think it was unwarranted. Um, one of the things that came up uh, was this whole five year thing. I think one of the things that our, our all of our population needs to realize was that this uh, was part of, or, sorry, this was over two councils. Of course, we had the election in uh, 2018. And last year, due to COVID, we decided that we weren't going to deal with this issue, um, just getting used to Zoom, et cetera. And um, Anna, can I get you to mute? Thank you. Um, and, uh, you know, and then when we, decide that we are gonna pick this up in 2021, um, then there are people that are saying, why are you doing this in the middle of COVID? So obviously, you know, we can't please everyone. Uh, I took very personally uh, the fact that people thought that we were ignoring Victor Castro, uh, and in fact, we were not. And I wanna thank a couple of the, the authors of the letters that um, reiterated things that Victor had said. Uh, I would also like to point out that the um, one law, uh, one dwelling per lot is part of the official plan of the County of Renfrew. In fact, it is not. That is our zoning in Bonashir Valley. And it's something that I've spoken to this council about that when we open up the entire zoning bylaw, uh, that is something uh, that we are being urged by the province and our senior housing strategists uh, to change to allow for second dwellings on a lot. Um, I just, uh, I wanted to also uh, note um, that one of the authors uh, asked why council would initiate this, uh, changing the RV bylaw. I would like to remind everybody that this was initiated by, the, um, by John Taker under the auspice of the LCPOA, uh, which we found out later on um, was not quite accurate that he was coming to us uh, as uh, under the land use committee, which was not made very clear to council. Um, there was a, also, I just want to qualify something. There was a letter that said that there was a 300 foot, uh, 300 foot setback from uh, Waters. Uh, that is in fact, um, not exactly correct. Um, we can talk about that. Also, um, one of the challenges was um, about taxation. Uh, as we know, if MPAC doesn't assess a uh, property, we can't tax. Um, so I think that uh, those were my lost here, but I won't open it to council. I want to talk all over time. I just wanted to, um, to just have been extremely professional and we have not made this personal uh, at any turn. Oh my, I'm just gonna go dark, but I'll leave my mic on. Um, we at no time have admonished uh, anybody publicly. And um, again, I think that it's shameful of people to be, to make this so personal uh, when in fact, this is a policy decision. Uh, and, uh, and that's what we are here to debate. So at that, um, I'm gonna leave it at that. Um, but if anybody, my apologies, guys. I had a lot of problems over the lunch break here with my laptop. Um, I had a full system crash. It was kind of wild. Um, so what I'm gonna do is uh, I'll just um, entertain comments, questions, considerations. Uh, I think that, you know, the two people that did presentations, uh, unfortunately, we don't have that, that extra line uh, presentations by those that want to compromise, uh, which, you know, maybe they had to pick a lane, right, where, what presentation they wanted to do. I want to thank both of those gentlemen. I thought that they both brought um, a very um, uh, measured, uh, some measured ideas. 
uh, to us, and I think that we should probably talk about them. Um, but at that, I will uh, entertain questions, comments, considerations from Council. Yes, Merv. Uh, I'll start it off. <laughs> the first thing I think we have to do is determine what is a lot. To just the definition of a lot, what is a lot? An acre, a half an acre, five acres, or 10 acres, I think we have to establish, define what is a lot. And one trailer per lot. I think that's one of the first things we have to do is establish what is a lot. Uh, and then I'm going to now speak to some of the other concerns just briefly. In uh, my view, what I refer to as permanent trailers, trailers that are hooked up to water and sewer, well, they, they normally have to obey by the setbacks. But if your trailer is hooked up to water and, to water and hydro, you must have a, a proper septic system. Uh, you can't just run a trailer there without a proper septic system. Uh, temporary trailers uh, for two or, two or three weeks. I, I can't see someone, so I would say, yeah, May, may, may have an outhouse, but using the trailer at night, yeah, they may get away with it, but I can't see somebody calling in the trailer into Eganville and dumping their, their tank uh, every week or every so. I've seen another solution to that. Uh, there are uh, uh, fiberglass tanks now that look like a, an oversized light bulb that they bury in the ground. They use the outhouse through the day and they use the trailer system at night and every fall they have it pumped out. And, and I think that's quite safe. But another thing that came to mind is uh, if they don't have hydro, is generators. I wouldn't want to be sitting in my cottage and have a trailer next door run the generator 24 seven because they like to have their trailer air conditioned. I think that's something else we got to think about as we, as we go through this bylaw again. That's well, my rant of the day. I, Thank you, Merv, I, I appreciate it. I actually, uh, on mine, on my sheet, I have lot size with an asterisk uh, beside it, uh, because that's definitely, that was a recurring theme. Uh, what is a lot size? And yeah. um, for those of you that don't know this, I am, I'm not good with, um, with measurements, believe it or not, uh, in order to uh, count how big my, my kitchen is, I have to count the 24 inch. <laughs> um, so um, <clears throat> I'm not sure uh, and this is where, where you guys are probably far better at this than I am. Like, is it reasonable that you, uh, you would have uh, one per acre or one per, per two acres? I, I don't know where we land there, but the, I had an asterisk beside lot size. So I'm glad you brought that up, Merv. Yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the, I don't mean to interrupt, but that's the exact point. I do we uh, restrict it to a half an acre or shall we say someone that has a hundred acres, yeah, they can have four trailers and hurt, hurt, hurt anybody, but we have to define what is a lot. Okay, uh, Brent, did you have your hand up? Well, I was just gonna say, we're, since, like my understanding, we're defining a lot as an uh, individual who owns a piece of property. It doesn't, my, my opinion, it doesn't really uh, make a difference what uh, lot size it is, is what we're saying is that once you have more than four, um, that you have to be commercially designated. So what we're saying is from one to four, uh, we're allowing. Um, and because it is a vehicle, we aren't restricting, I guess, how many vehicles are within a property on top of that. And then for Murr's point for the generator, there is already restrictions for running a generator. Um, you can only run it up to 11 p.m. at night. You can start it at seven and that's within our actual noise bylaw. Um, so that's not a concern that we should ever have, um, but be it uh, like or like a, a recreational vehicle, I think really it comes down to the basics of our actual bylaw. And that's really declaring that a recreational vehicle is a vehicle. Um, and when it does become a, a structure, that's when the chief building official steps in. And, that, and that's a totally different beast, I guess, is what we're saying. But on the basis of it is, we're what uh, my understanding of our bylaw is that we're saying a recreational vehicle is a vehicle it's 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 kind of common sense you're able to pull it move it um change allocations we have a dumping station for gray water within the township and then end of the day it's illegal to pour gray water anywhere on your property uh that's what the mason environment is for and that's the enforcement agent for that um i guess it, unless i'm incorrect but that's my understanding so if someone does uh witness this then they should report it to the ministry i think that's very people's due diligence on the concern for the environment of it 
Thank you, Brent. Uh, Tim, you got your hand up? Yeah, I, uh, I'll have to circle back. I have a bunch of stuff jotted down from what, uh, you know, has been going on for the last while regarding this issue. Um, both yourself and uh, Brent have addressed a lot of things and concerns that I was uh, going to put forward regarding uh, impacts assessment and uh, Brent, you hit the nail right on the head with the, with the vehicle structure and also with the uh, generators and such like that, we have noise bylaws already in effect for that. And as far as it goes for lot size and lot designation, the amount of RVs on a lot is going to be dictated by the lot size. So if you only have, you know, if you had a, a 40 square foot lot, you're not going to put four RVs on it because it's not going to allow you to do so. And most people wouldn't comfortably want to, but that, that, that's really none of my concern. It's uh, like Brent said, it's like telling them how many cars or how many snowmobiles they should have or, or you know, things along that sort on the same chunk of ground. The, the property itself is going to designate to that with the maximum of four. And a lot of people have brought that up in the past. You know, why, why did you come up with four? Because of what I just said, the property at size is going to dictate that. And, and if I could have went with 10, I would have went with 10 or if I could have went with 20 or a thousand because as we, we look into this, your, your lot size is, is going to be dependent on, on, on what, how, or how many vehicles are actually there. Um, I, I don't believe that for the, the vehicle use portion of it, that, we really have any control or, or regulation because like Councillor Patrick has said, once we start hooking things up to it, now it has to fall within the setbacks and it, and it, and it has to, we have to adhere to what our zoning is and, and our CBO will, will reintegrate again what, what, what is permissible. So it, it, it's not, uh, it's not going to be, I don't believe a Mad Max situation out there where everybody is going to, you know, uh, come together and, and just start piling RVs onto lots and such. Uh, I think it's further from that. It, it just gives people an opportunity to, to, to enjoy their property. Um, and, and like I say, once it, the, the provisions are in there for, for if it's hooked up to anything, it has to be set back. And there are what they call honey wagons. There are uh, those big boats and such. If you wanted to leave your trailer there and hook it up and drain your, your, your tanks into that and use the, the facilities we have provided at Bonisher Valley, there's ways to do so. And I, and I hope that the uh, people in and around the lakes could educate their neighbors if they don't know that that facility is there. Because once they start dumping stuff on the ground, that, that, that is illegal. We can't do that. I'd never support that. Um, we have taken the initiative and the steps to provide alternatives in a safe way for basically everyone to enjoy the lake without really causing an impact. But further to that, I, I did do a, a, a little bit of a note taking here. And if I'd like to, to, to take just a couple more minutes and I, I wanna thank Mayor Murphy for your knowledge with the official plan. And, and I know you've been working on it for quite some time and, and you have provided us with really good information as a council back and forth as well as Annette uh, and, and Councillor Patrick, uh, you've, we've been at this for a while now and, you know, we, we've, we've seen a lot of, uh, you know, uh, controversy coming in from uh, the, the, the municipality and your knowledge on the uh, building and stuff, you, you're really good at it. And I, and I appreciate your advice and your, your stuff going forward with it. Uh, Councillor Rosner uh, with, with all the people in Sebastopol and Derek, cares and concerns where this initiated from, uh, you provided us with a lot of uh, insight on that. And, and Merv, you know, you've been around lakes and you've been on council as a senior member for so long. I, I think we've all got a lot of expertise happening around here. Sandra, Dana, uh, you know, Sandra's had been a big part of this right from the get-go. Dana as well. Uh, and Mark has given us ample amount of information we're very fortunate here in Bonisher Valley to have a great team. And, and I, I uh, appreciate working with this on, with all of you. You know, it's been a, a really good, healthy debate. And not one of us have come into this one-sided. 
you know, we're, we're, we're trying to be very fair to everyone. And, and, and that's what I want these people to know. Uh, I heard a lot of opposition to where they think that we, we were not giving an open mind to our decision making or, or that they were made up. No, we, we, we took a lot of things into consideration over the last few years since I've been on council. And my gosh, you know, there, there's been a lot of give and take as far as I'm concerned. And, and you know, uh, what, what you're going to see is that if any of the RVs that they're, they're calling permanent, well, they are, they're gonna have to adhere to, to the CBO's direction. It, it, it's there, it's a given, it's not a free for all. And like I say, it's not gonna be a, a Mad Max situation here, I, I, I don't believe. So, you know, with, with that, with that being said, um, uh, you know, the, the condes condescension uh, uh, from what I hear from, from one side is basically if you own an RV, you're, you're going to destroy the lake. And, and I'd like to remove that from the equation. Um, here in Canada, we're innocent until proven guilty. Uh, just because you own an RV doesn't mean you're going to start dumping things into the lake. Uh, I don't believe that any one of us should just assume things like that. Um, I'd like to think that the residents and the people that come here to enjoy the place are, are going to take care of it. And I really hope they do. And um, another point I've heard was uh, my taxes are high and uh, I don't know why that somebody else can have something and not pay the amount of taxes I do. Well, I'd like to address that in telling people that vacant land in Bonisher Valley is taxed. Everybody that owns property here in Bonisher Valley is taxed. And the amount of tax you pay, whether it be a dollar or a $10,000 bill a year, does not dictate your priority with me at the council table. I don't like to, to have anybody with their definition of I'm wealthy and I should be a higher priority. That does not count. And I don't think it ever will with anybody here at this table. And I would like to eliminate that from any thought or concern. Um, it definitely, definitely does not have any extra weight on what your tax bill is on, on how we treat you. So uh, we're trying to be fair to everyone. And in the in closing guys, I'd like to say Lake Clear is for everyone. It, uh, Bonisher Valley is for everyone. No matter w whether you can afford a, a $10 million home or all you can have is your RV to enjoy the place. I wanna make sure everyone can come here, feel welcome and enjoy the community. And that's the thing. And don't forget when these guys are bringing these RVs in for the weekend or for the week, they're shopping local, they're buying gas, they're buying uh, amenities and they're supporting Bonisher Valley. And uh, I want to thank everybody for getting us this far. And I appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks for those very kind words, Tim. I could not agree with you more. Uh, it was always our mantra at our shop that I don't care if you drive a $2,000 relic or you drive a $200,000 uh, expensive car, everybody is treated the same way. Everybody deserves to be treated with kindness and dignity and fairness. And I think that through this process, uh, we've heard um, from uh, both sides and um, from people actually right down the middle uh, that have some really great ideas on how to, how to make this uh, a little more pal palatable for both sides. Um, Jack has not had an opportunity to speak. Go ahead, Jack. All right. <clears throat> Um, just a couple of points. Um, from the letters that we received, it, it looks like it's almost a dead even split down the middle. We're looking like 45 percent for, fifty five percent against. The way I think a lot of people that are against, from what I gathered from listening to their letters, is they're seeing it as we're allowing or we're proposing to allow up to four RVs on any lot size with no setbacks, with no connected to gray water, none of these, we're basically just gonna give a free for all. And I think it, if we propose and we go forward with this and 
sure an RV is an RV is a trailer if they're coming in for a weekend or two weeks or whatever. And if they have appropriate way to look after their um, septic system, so be it. But for these permanent ones um, that are semi-permanent or they're annually or semi-annually or whatever they are, these RVs that are being used, I fully believe, and uh, they have to be the ones that are tied in with decks and the ones that are tied in with whatever, that they're not easily pulled away, that they have to follow, follow the setbacks like the letter we received from, uh, from the Ministry of the Environment. There's basically five points in there that they point out. And I think we're under that obligation to follow those points. And what I mean by that is that if they're there for any length of time, they have to be set back appropriately so they won't impact the shoreline, that they won't have, uh, you know, they follow the setbacks as another dwelling, because now it becomes a dwelling once it's hard faced in or, or decks or anything on it. And um, also that they have appropriate septic to, uh, septic in place to get their septic. Either they have, um, like Merv was saying, they have uh, honey wagons or whatever they have, or they're tied into the other septic. And, and I think the thing we have to touch on is we have to hammer out how many per lot. I've been at, talking to quite a few people and the, the normal response that I've gotten is people are fine with it if you have 100 feet frontage per RV. So that would mean like, for example, you need about 500 foot of frontage on the lake to have four RVs. In. People are comfortable with that. It does, then it doesn't look like an RV park. It doesn't look like they're one on top of each other. They're spread out. And, and that, uh, you know, gives them, and that's, then it's, you're not going to have these 40, 50 little groups of RVs popped up all over the place. It's going to be based on how much fr square or how much frontage they have along the lake to put these RVs in. And I think that would address uh, some of the comments that we got from MPAC where it says you have to have a appropriate, um, if I just look at one of the comments here. It says consideration to the assessment of accumulated impacts in groundwater for drinking water and environmental lake capacity of the township's lakes, in particular Lake Clear. So if you're spreading them out that they're not one on top of each other, you're going to meet this assessment for the groundwater, you're going to consider to ensure that the appropriate number of recreational vehicles on each property is appropriate for the water sewage services that they were designed for. So if you have five, 600 feet of frontage, you have more ground and appropriate ground to have more sewage systems if required. And then if, if they're tied in, then they're going to have to be looked at as a permanent structure and then impact will have to address it accordingly. That That's... I think where we have to go. And if we present that forward, I think a lot of the people that are against it will come around to it because there has to be a middle somewhere in here. You can't say there's not gonna be any RVs and you can't say you can do whatever you want when on the size of the lot. So my feeling is from the general context that I got from most of the letters is they're looking for some sort of um, parameters that the township is gonna put in. Now, those are the type of parameters we have to put in. We can follow the letter from the Ministry of Environment and we can space it on how many trailers per, per size, per lot size. And if we pick a hundred foot frontage per trailer, I think we're, we're in the right direction. That's, that's my thoughts on it. Thank you, Jack. Um, so just a question for you then. What if you had like a long skinny lot, like, you have a hundred foot feet of frontage, but then you've got like 30 acres behind you. Like, I think, I get what you're, I totally get what you're saying. And I, I understand that maybe they, they do need to be divided into two categories. Ones that are hardscape that have to adhere to build code and setbacks, et cetera. Um, and ones that are more transient um, so uh, yeah, more debate to follow. Okay. Yeah. Um, Brent, yes. I was just going to say, but everything goes back to how we're defining what a recreational vehicle is like within our definition, it says, which has running gear, uh, in towing equipment that is permanently attached and is not permanently affixed to the ground. I uh, traveled to a trailer tent. So like, for example, if it is adhered to the ground that prevents it from moving, then it, it, in my understanding, then it is, it, it does become 
uh, chief building official's responsibility because it doesn't fall into the recreational vehicle stand date. So for example, if someone has a deck that's permanently affixed to the recreational vehicle, then it negates it being a recreational vehicle. And that's something that we're clarifying uh, right now. Like for example, if it's jacked up and put on a, a foundational blocks, uh, that's preventing it from being a recreational vehicle and having the mobility. So within our actual definition of what we're defining a recreational vehicle is, we're actually eliminating a lot of those uh, concerns. And yes, there is going to be a lot of examples. But the thing is, is this is a, this is, um, a definition of what a recreational vehicle is. And it is, up to the, it is up to the CBO at that point to determine if it is now becoming, um, if it's not a recreational vehicle anymore. And that really depends if it is permanently affixed to the ground. Um, and, that's, and that's really, I think we just have to rely on a recreational vehicle as a whole. Okay, Tim, go ahead. Yeah, I wanted to agree with Brent on that. We have provisions in that definition already Regarding the setbacks, what, we, what we're defining is if it's basically, an, we're defining the RV as, as, as the same as basically a tent or something that's not taxable. Uh, anytime you have the dwelling or the RV attached to something, it becomes a dwelling, it becomes impact assessed. Now it has to follow the regulations that it's, it's already in, in the law. So if you can move it, we're... We're actually limiting RVs more so by doing what we are by saying you can only have four, then, then, then per se, like like letting anything not there as far as I'm concerned, because anybody that's permanently attached or it's, it's a structure that's hooked up to anything has to abide by all the rules and regulations as the cottages do. So, so therefore you, you have to fall within Mark's jurisdiction. So it, what, what we're basically defining is that that pole trailer that comes in, whether it be 15 foot tent trailer or a, a, a 40 foot fifth wheel, uh, when you're in there for the weekend or whatever it may be, or for the week or the month, as long as you're not dumping on the ground or you're not hooked up to water, we, we don't want to, to interact or to, we don't have enforcement for that. We don't want to interact with that. It's when you start, you, you start, and believe me, it's not going to turn into a big, massive uh, trailer park here because a lot of people on the lake, as we know, don't like them. So you're not going to have a bunch of these lots, every lot that's on the lake with four RVs because we already know there are 60 people that don't like RVs. Or, uh, to, you know, so or whatever, 55% of, of these people with that road in. So they're, they're not going to have the RVs even on the lake. And it's basically a place that... Uh, it, it, as far as I'm concerned, where you can bring a trailer in for the weekend, you're allowed to have four on your property, or you can have it for the summer or whatever it may be, and you can use your property. So I, I really don't want to get involved in, in any other setbacks with, with that type of vehicle, because really it's out of our jurisdiction as far as I'm concerned, because it's a vehicle. It'd be the same thing as saying, we can't park your, your boat close to the, to the, to the shore, you know, you can't park it there. You can have a cabin cruiser and you can have all the facilities in it. Well, well, do we eliminate that from being on the property as well? Because it's basically the same thing. They've got facilities in them. They, you know, you can have a big boat. Like do we tell people how many boats they can park there or use on the lake? And, and, and as far as I'm concerned, anything that attaches it to now becomes, uh, 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 becomes Mark's jurisdiction. And, and then it has to follow the, the setback rules and all the other rules that go with the product. Okay, so I just wanna to touch on a couple of things. I also wrote down enforcement. And I think that, um, you know, we don't have the human nor financial resources uh, to do enforcement at the best of times. And I think that that, that, is, that will be a challenge. Um, I just wanna go back uh, to Jack's 45-55 split. If you actually look at the list, um, the, um, our office staff made the list. They only included one letter from each person. And then if somebody, if, if there was a family that had five more people, it says plus five. So the numbers are actually pretty much 50-50. They're not exactly 50-50, but they're almost 50-50. 
um, which is, I mean, divisive is, is an understatement. Um, I just want to go back. I, I think that three of us have touched on lot size. Um, I, I think that there do need to be some parameters, but I want to ask something before we go any further. You know, we had that wonderful um, gentleman, the lawyer, uh, Mr. Crossan, and we had Mr. O'Brien, who was offering to do a little fact-finding mediation between the two sides. Does anybody want to take him up on that um, to maybe help with crafting uh, something that would be palatable to both sides and to council? Yes, Brent. Uh, and I've thought about that offer as well. And the thing is, is I've, I don't think it should involve um, my opinion, the township end, unless members want to sit on it. But I think that uh, if as a private individual, he wants to sit down with uh, this problem that's been existing, I guess, for about last five years uh, and work with both sides, then I, I see no reason. It's not negative. And to be honest, both sides, maybe they have been communicating for the last bite, in my opinion. Uh, that can be done without the involvement of the township. And I think it'd be best served uh, if they do come up with uh, some kind of substantive um, bylaw or alternative across the whole township or specifically to Lake Clear, that it's something obviously we can look at a later date. However, that this has been going on for five, five years um, and we were in the middle of making your decision as well. So really I look at it and yes, more, more the merrier if people want to talk. Um, but uh, I, I would say it can be left in private hands if they want to reach out to both sides. So all the letters are public, uh, so it's not very hard to uh, track down where people live. Yeah, I, and I don't. Dis I wasn't suggesting that we get involved in it, nor was I suggesting that we make this like an October thing. I was just thinking if something could be done, say in the next month. Um, you know, obviously people are meeting by Zoom still. Uh, so it's not hard to put together a meeting with, uh, you know, a group of people um, and, you know, maybe, maybe this, the, uh, that Mr. O'Brien, who is a mediator, maybe he's got some ideas on how to bring us closer to an agreement um, where again, it's palatable to both sides, but I, 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 I'm not, suggesting that we throw this on the private sector. I'm just asking, you know, we were, we were given this offer this morning and uh, do we want to take them up on it? That's the only reason I was bringing it back. Yes, Tim. One thing I'd just like to say, seeing the results of, of what has come in, how much more of a compromise can we really get if we're at a 50-50? Because when, when you look at when you look at the opposition and opposition, and if we met in a 50-50 dead on, that means both sides are equally meeting in the middle here. If it was stacked all one side or the other, I think we would have to go further into this investigation, but obviously we're entertaining as many as we're dis disappointing. So it, it, okay. it's, not, it, it, it's not cut and dried, but I'm, I'm going to tell you, we're not as far off the mark as what, some people may think. Okay, but to your point, Tim, I think one of the things in a lot of the letters in opposition were questioning lot size. You know, they weren't saying we don't want RVs at all. They were questioning why it's four per lot without any parameters. So that's why I think that there's a discussion to be had. And I actually, um, if it went one way or the other way, uh, you know, if it was 75, 25, well, we have our answer. When it's 50, 50, it makes it very difficult. And that's why, that's where I think a compromise comes into play. I mean, I've thought of lot size and setbacks the whole way around. And I've never, you know, all, all four of you and our staff know, I've been saying that since day one, that optimally I would like setbacks. Some, in some instances, the lots aren't big enough. And I, and I understand that. And I know that, you know, one of the arguments is that there are cottages that were built in the fifties that are, you know, way closer than the, the, than the setbacks. So I just, I'm, I'm just throwing it out there, guys. I do not want to kick this down the road any further, but I'm just wondering what you guys think. Uh, Tim, I'm just going to take Jack very, Jack had his hand up a while ago. Sorry. 
Okay. Um, uh, I agree. We're, I don't think we're that far apart, but my, from talking to people, I think they just don't understand. They, they thought this, I'm going to come back to it again, Tim, and I know you, you touched on it that that's not what the bylaw says, but their interpretation is it's a free for all for RVs. We have to nail this down. And if, if this was nailed down properly, that uh, RVs that are, are more permanent have restrictions. And I think if that was in place, I don't see anybody that's arguing, complaining about somebody bringing in their, their daughter, their son or whatever, they come in for two or three RVs for a week or two weeks. Nobody cares about that. What they're more concerned about is these more permanent, uh, they're seeing them as a workaround. And I think we have to, that that RV, that uh, bylaw has to be hammered out to them so they understand that there is restrictions for these more permanent type RVs. You know? But, but what, what you're saying, what, what, Sorry, you're saying that, what you're saying there, Jack, is already in place though. Um, we have it because it it's their interpretation, but it's not what the bylaw states. Um, and just because they might have heard or misheard through the grapevine that this is the way it is doesn't mean that's the way our bylaw is written. Because once they go into any one, and, and this is what I'm trying to tell everybody, and it's the clarification, the people that have phoned me. As soon as most of these people actually read our bylaw and understand what we're defining here, they realize that if you do have anything attached or it's a more permanent structure, it has to fall follow the guidelines of the structures, uh, our CBO's recommendations of setbacks and stuff. So those provisions are already there. It's not like we're, we're adding or subtracting. What we're really defining with this RV bylaw is, is the pull-in travel type of trailer. And it's not even allowed to be hooked up to water. So if you have somebody coming in for the weekend, I don't want to say the people who have a hundred acre lot on Lake Clear and I have uh, a, a knowledge of people with 1700 feet of, of property of, of lakefront on Lake Clear. Uh, why would they not be allowed to have four there? Uh, or it really restricts them to not having five or six or seven because they can really only have four on a lot, right? So as soon as you start plugging that thing into water or hooking up a sewer hose, you, you, now you, you have to adhere to the setbacks. It's already in our law. If it wasn't, I, would, I could see that. But I think what we have to do is, is educate people a little bit clearer on that there is a lot of provisions and, and there's a lot of uh, uh, stipulation when it comes to the permanent style of, of RV. And it, then it doesn't fall under the RV anymore as we're defining it. It changes into a whole department here. It goes into another area where we do regulate. You know, so I don't know if we're on the same page here. That, 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 did I flip over one? Well, uh, anybody want to correct no, me no, on that? Okay. I thought, I thought this I, is where I we were I froze up, sorry. I froze I'm, up. But I was, yeah, go ahead, Jack. I'm just, I'm just, I agree with you, Tim, that's what's in the bylaw, but the people don't, the people don't see it that way. They don't read it that way. And the other thing that we have to, we have to clarify we have to clarify is how many per lot size that has to be nailed down. You can't just say arbitrarily you can put, I know you have no problem putting four, four RVs in a small lot, but it doesn't determine if it's hardscaped in how many you have per lot size. There's, there's no determination on that. And that's the problem, right? So, yeah, and that's hardscaped. It has to fall under, it, it falls under our, our buildings bylaw. Yes, Brent, go ahead. I was just going to say like, uh, yeah, my, my understanding. So if it is like, if it is hardscaped and uh, Mark's going to come and look at it, well, there has to be certain setbacks, but like be it a deck or be it as some form of structure. Um, that That's just, that's just my opinion. And uh, my, like we've heard it time and again, why four and, and really the designation for like uh, commercial is for more for the commercial um, like RV parks and stuff within our township. Um, but no, I have no problem with, uh, four vehicles on someone's property, be it a recreational vehicle or whatnot. Um, but, uh, I think, I think also, uh, my, my whole point on this whole bylaw and wanting to see it move forward is the fact that 
you're seeing all this focus for five years um, on an RV issue that was brought with the previous council. This council has now taken over and we're trying to move forward a bylaw. But the thing is, you look at within that time period, we have invasive species that have gone on one of our on Lake Clear. And I think the focus should solely be on these invasive species, the seagulls. I think it should be on the waterways within our township. And I think if, if we just kind of get over this one point, I guess, is because from all the letters, like we receive letters from people complaining about someone's, say, 400 or 300 square foot RV, but these people reside in a 4,000 4, or 5,000 square foot house. Well, if you put that in comparison, th their house is worth 12, 12 RVs. So really, who is more detrimental to the waterways, um, especially if you utilize Victor Castro numbers on how it does impact the water quality um, of a lake or a waterway? Um, and really, you look at like, um, I know in the OP this year, they're going to be clarifying at capacity further, but really when you look at it, and if we want to specifically talk about Lake Clear, well, we talked about several meetings ago about, I think it was 12 homes that were built, seven, 17 additions, uh, 44 uh, new septics just along um, the Lake Clear waterfront. Uh, so really when you look at that, it's like, yes, there, there is development, but it really it comes down to why, why is there no opposition to say new, new dev, uh, neither am I selling, saying I'm opposed to new development there, but why aren't these people concerned about the new development if it has more of an impact on the water quality of the lake? Or why are people concerned with an RV backing um, recreational, maybe going close to the waterway, uh, but not opposed to say boats backing their, um, or vehicles backing their boats into the waterways and fridges on that uh, quality of life. So really, I, I, I just really want um, us to somehow keep moving forward on this issue in the sense that uh, there's other things that this lake or we should be concerned about our waterways that need to have the focus of our organizations and committees. And I neither do I think that we should spend, uh, well, in my opinion, any more time on what started out as a neighbor dispute um, than now we're dealing with five years later um, and now we're clarifying it. In my opinion, our definition of what a recreational vehicle is, is limiting what the recreational vehicles that we have in place right now, because we are removing uh, the, yes, the structure aspect of it, but also what we're saying, and we're continuously saying is that once it becomes a permanently fixed into the ground that our CBO does step in and as a chief building official, he does have a lot more authority as, uh, than a bylaw officer. Because as we all know, we can barely, we, well, we're part-time council. We have part-time bylaw. We don't have the funds to, uh, in all honesty, start removing all these things. So we need to have a common sense uh, definition. I think the one we have does make sense. Thanks, Brent. And I, uh, I just want to touch on something that you just said. Um, I think that there is a, a lack of understanding by some that we are a part-time council, that we meet twice a month. And so five years might seem like a long time, but when you remove uh, the COVID year and the fact that we do only meet twice a month, that is not a lot of time. And we have all given a Friday here um, designated to this specific issue. I couldn't agree with you more. It is time for us to make a decision and move on. Um, but I definitely think as Merv said and, and Jack said, I think we need to determine lot size, frontage, whatever it, whatever it is. Um, and, uh, and I don't disagree that, that we need to educate people on what, what is a recreational vehicle and what happens when it's hardscaped. Now, the other thing is that what's come up is that there have been some go rounds so that it, you know, it looks like it's hardscape, but the deck isn't attached. So there, you know, there's some of that going on that we need to be cognizant of. Um, uh, I don't know what, else, sorry, I lost my train of thought there. Um, sorry, guys, I just completely blanked out. <laughs> Uh, Jen, I, I was just going to make a quick note. And um, like, so when it comes to a deck being built, as long as they're within the, uh, I guess, the parameters of uh, the building code or how we issue permits, um, be it if, if it's not affixed to it or permanently attached, then yes, yeah, some people may look at it as a go around. Uh, no different than, I guess, a lot of uh, people that have dwellings or their homeowners don't affix their decks to their property to avoid getting a permit to certain points, right? So really what we're saying is that 
as long as it's not permanently atta- attached to it or that's uh, impacting the movement of the recreational vehicle, be it a pop-up trailer, a uh, trailer, a 400 square foot, a uh, little, uh, I don't know, van. Um, really, when it comes, really comes down to it, uh, as long as it's not in the CBO's direction, then uh, in impacting the movement of it, then that falls within our definition. Okay, so um, where I lost my train of thought was actually sort of where you just picked up. Um, I think that I did not realize when we had our deck built, I didn't realize I didn't need a, a building permit because it's not attached to our house. I got one anyway. Lots of people might, might not know that rule either. So they might get a building permit. Um, and, and that of course triggers MPAC. So then you're assessed. Um, uh, yeah, Tim, go ahead. The only thing I'm concerned with, if we start getting into lot size, we're actually contradicting ourselves in defining the RV. Because as I've said over and over again, as soon as you do any of those things, now you have to follow the, the, the guidelines of, of what the CBO, CBO sets out. So we have to say it is or it isn't. We can't do both here. I think if we, we start defining it as anything other than an RV uh, and start dictating how many you can have on a lot other than what we're maximum allowed to do without being commercial, we're going into a different pond. So now, now we have to, you know, we're almost contradicting our, our, our definition then. Because how, how so, Tim, I think, I think what the ministry was recommending and what Jack and Mer both uh, cited earlier um, was that, yeah, you would be uh, allowed up to four because of course five puts you into commercial, but it would be dependent. So if you have an acre, you're not gonna put four, uh, I don't even know how big an acre is. You're not gonna put four RVs on an acre. And I think therein lies one of the concerns. Um, and, and of course it's Pan Township, except for the village of Eganville. And I would like to address something that was said today that we were protecting the water and sewer of Eganville um, when in fact we are only at something like 37 to 40% capacity and could use lots more people on water and sewer. So I thought that that was sort of a, a funny statement. Um, but I, I think that that was, a, it was a um, compromise from many people that wrote in and in fact was a recommendation of the ministry I don't think that it changes our definition. I think it just says, you know, use your use your God-given brain that, you know, if you have an acre, you're not putting four on that acre. If you've got 25 feet of frontage on the lake, you're not putting four on that 25 foot, um, you know, ribbon of life. So I just, I, I'm just throwing that out there, but I, I think that somehow we need to come up with, with a massage of this bylaw. And I don't think that the bylaw is necessarily, I don't think that we're throwing out the baby with the bathwater. I think that it just needs some parameters in place. And in fact, mm-hmm. maybe to delineate a little more um, of what uh, Jack was saying, or maybe it was Brent that was saying um, about making sure people understand once it's hardscaped, that's now, you are now in dwelling territory and you do have to adhere to building code setbacks, uh, uh, septic, well, the entire, the entire thing. So I just, I think that maybe we need to massage it a bit. Uh, go ahead, Brent. No, I was, uh, uh, no, like I, and I, and as I said before, I think a lot of it just comes down to uh, people actually need to go back to, I guess, the original primary source document, which is our bylaw. And even reading some of the letters, I don't think some people actually even read our bylaw. They were just emailed uh, a summary of what it was interpreted as. But the thing is, is when you actually uh, read through our bylaw and we explain what our definition of recreational vehicle is, um, some people who have recreational vehicles will have, have to adapt to the new parameters that it cannot be permanently fixed into the ground or can't have certain features. But And, and I, th- I think that if we need to add more detail, but the thing is, when I read it, I, I see no reason. I think really it's no different than people just have to go back to the primary source document 
Um, and really, when you look at it, yes, it's a 50 50 uh, split. But in, I remember in, I think it was um, uh, on Debbie, Debbie's article in the Egan Bowl Leader, January 27th, the LCPO president did state that silence can be, silence can be interpreted as uh, consent. So, consent to her bylaw is what she was stating that if you didn't write in and oppose it, so really, when you look at it, okay, we have about 3,500 other residents in Bonisher Valley, I guess, according to the LCPO president, that I guess 3,500 people are consenting uh, to that and only about 81 opposed. So I'm, I'm just stating that there generally is always a silent majority, in my, in my opinion, and because it takes a lot more courage, say, for people to um, come out and support something when there's a lot of people that are very vocal uh, towards it, especially in a small neck community like ours. Um, but no, I think really people just have to go back to the primary source document, which is our bylaw, um, and read and read it through. And uh, if people still can't understand that, then uh, we can ask for a summary, I guess, from our building inspector for an actual thing. Okay, well, this is exactly uh, what would qualify in a recreational vehicle for becoming a structure, which would qualify it having to abide by setbacks or having some form of permutation. Um, but also if someone say is on a small lot, so if you could take an example of Lake Clear Road, a significant amount of those uh, waterfront uh, spots, they're, they're leased from the township on a lot of components of it. So they don't have the capacity to put a recreational vehicle right on, I guess you would say the ribbon of life at that point. Um, and it is a, it is a large lake, but no, that's, it's really, I have no problem if we want to clarify stuff, but when it comes to a lot, I think four is an appropriate number. Um, especially when we do have the conditions that we are labeling it as a vehicle. Um, some people, yes, will be pulling it in and out, no different than I don't think we moderate how many ice shocks are on the lake. There's a significant number out this year. Um, yeah, I think that's done by the ministry, actually. Um, but no, that's that's the all I had to say right now. Thank you. Uh, Merv, we haven't heard from you in a while. Well, I, I quite frankly, um, with, with Jack, um, as Brett said, he's got no problem with four vehicles on a lot. What size a lot? What size a lot? We'll never have a moment's peace until we define what is a lot. What size a lot? Would, how small a lot would you allow four vehicles or four trailers on, Brett? Well, if, if a lot, if you, if the average, say, a recreational vehicle is, say, 300, 400 square feet, and your lot's only 400 square feet, how many uh, RVs do you think you can fit on it, Murph? It's like, well, I don't know. It's, I don't it's, know it's, what people well, will try. It, it's, I don't know what people will try. It's it's com it's common sense. But like, common sense sometimes don't apply. You, you got to have regulations. Y yes, but a lot is dictated get, by. It's common sense to drive within the speed limit, but they still have speeding uh, tickets. Yeah, hundred percent, and that's why if someone abuses, say, a recreational vehicle and throws gray water, you have the ministry to call. But when it comes to a lot size, Merv, a lot size is dictated by who owns it. So if it's one property owner, one property owner owns it. Uh, if an abutting property owner, say, owns the land beside them, generally they merges, so it becomes one lot. Um, that it's it's kind of simple from there. Yes, Tim, go ahead, and then Jack. So, so the way I look at it, guys, when we're starting to get into that, uh, you're only going to park so many vehicles in my yard too. Uh, if they're licensed vehicle, I, I, I'm not going to park three thousand vehicles in my three quarters of an acre lot. It's not possible to fit them. But if I can manage to wedge them in within the size of my property, it's really nobody's business. And that's why I like to stand up for property rights and property, people with their private property. And it's really nobody's concern if it's a vehicle parked in there that they have a license plate on. I, I, as, as far as it goes, we can't go more than four. And you know what, if the, if the property is a thousand acres, they're still limited to whatever that may be in that lot. We have lots and concessions, right? And, and you can have a hundred acre lot up to, that would be the maximum. So if you have five, 500 acres, you've got five lots and you, you can put your RVs on, uh, uh, 20, 20 RVs on there, right? So, so you're, you're limited to that. And there, if, if the size is down where you've only got 50 square feet, like Brent said, you're not gonna put five RVs on it because now you're on someone else's property. So I, I don't see how there's an issue here without actually stepping on people's property rights because it, it, it's as far as I'm concerned it's really none of our business if they can fit it on there somehow some way shape or form or if they stack the sons of guns on top of one another that's not my concern if they're not hooked up to water if they're not pumping no uh, septic into into the lake and they're not destroying anything 
like I said before, this is Canada. They're innocent until proven guilty. If they're not out there dumping stuff, I'm not going to sit there and assume that they are. And, and this whole stigma that as soon as you own an RV from a lot of this uh, letters and these letters that I've heard, they automatically assume that you're a bad guy and you're just going to let things fly. I don't understand how that's even a thing. Uh, and I'd like to, uh, as far as I'm concerned, I find it very insulting that they think that that's the way it's going to be. So, no, I, 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 I agree 100% with Brent that, you know what, we, 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 if they need clarification on our bylaw, we've hashed this out quite a few times. Um, I, I'm ready to push forward on it. I like it the way it is. And, um, no, I, I'll stand behind it 100% because I think we've hit a lot of nails on the heads here. And, and no, uh, you wouldn't like it if somebody told me you, you couldn't park your, 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 your family and friends come over to your house. No, you can't park there because you've already got two vehicles in your yard. That'd be totally inappropriate, but it's the same thing because it's a vehicle. Oh, you can't have two tractors. You can only have one tractor. I don't like two tractors. And it's getting down to the condescending looking at what's going on in your neighbor's yard. And for the most part, I wish they'd look in their own, clean up their own stuff before they start poking at other people's. And that's where this all got started. It's, I, I, I like uh, a million dollar house and a million dollar view, but I don't want to look at that guy because he can't afford it. And that's what it's coming down to. And, and I, I, frankly, I'm sick and tired of hearing that kind of thing around here. Because there's been a lot of people that uh, with, with property values, they say the property value is going to go down. Well, I'm going to tell you, a lot of people work around here they have a hard time buying or will never afford a chunk of property around here because the property value is going up. You know, you got people coming in and they say that, well, your property going, it's going down. A lot of people like that because now they might even have a chance to afford a chunk of Bonisher Valley. So there's a lot of sides to these stories and, and I, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and dictate how many vehicles someone can park in their land. Okay. Over to you, Jack. Okay. Um, I just want to, try and um, bring this around then. So according to yourself, Tim, and to Brent, if we, if a guy had a half acre lot, he could pull in four RVs and they could sit there for the whole summer. Is that correct? Is that what you're saying? If they were not hooked up to anything, Jack, yeah, for sure. If it fits under a lot, why, why couldn't they? Okay. So that's, and, and that is, uh, so if they just pull in their RVs, they don't hook them up. Uh, they could have people living in them and then it's up to the ministry to control if they, if whatever happens to their septic or their sewer or whatever, or basically, it's, right? It's up to them to control it. Absolutely. And if they're breaking the law by, by dumping their gray water on the ground, now, now they're breaking the law. We have provided them with provisions in order to, to properly dispose of their waste. We have taken that initiative. We did that in the first year on council. We, we put that forward. There's no reason for them to do that. Zero, zilch, it's there. There are multiple ways. If they can drag that RV to the lake, they can drag their septic to our dumping station. It's not hard to do. I think so, we should. Okay, so, so then if the RVs are set up with hardscape or whatever, then they fall underneath the building code. So therefore right. they're no longer classed in RV. That's the way. That's right. Absolutely. Guys, now they have to adhere. Guys, uh, we've been going at this for an hour and we just got a really lovely email from um, Mr. O'Brien uh, that has um, seven salient points. I'd like to take five minutes. I want to review this letter because what he's saying is exactly what Tim and Jack were just speaking of, that there is confusion and he and he's actually um, speaking to this in his email. I'd really like an opportunity uh, just to read it um, and then come back. Um, I, I know that we're not voting on this. E we're not voting on this today. Um, but I think if we if we did to three o'clock, uh, and then um, we'll call it a day, and we'll we'll come back to it at a committee meeting. If, is so that a good can you forward the email to us so we can read the comments? Uh, and that sent it to all of you. And she sent it to all of us? Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I should have made that clear. So we'll just take five, okay, Annette?
Hey guys. Hello. Did we lose Merv altogether? Yeah, I guess we did. Probably left the meeting. Did he leave? Sandra, are there? Are you there? Can you call Merv? Please. Thank you. When he, he takes, takes a break, break he, he takes, takes a break. break. That's right. Was everybody ready for the beautiful sunshine weekend coming ahead? Yeah. Oh my, my goodies, gosh. My goodness showed up. Hurts. Yeah, they showed up during the break. Oh, that is fantastic. Yeah. Great news, Jack. Yeah. Great news. Okay, Merv is trying to rejoin, so we'll just give him a minute here. Jack, those are the plans for the part? Or for the EGC, I mean? Yeah, yeah, they're the two boards that we suspect they're faulty. So I'll put them in later today or tomorrow, probably, probably tomorrow. When, when, you, when you first showed it that you got, and Jen was so happy, I thought it might have been like they sent you like a titanium hip or something. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, I, thought but, they were knee, I thought they were knee pads. <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. IKEA. Yeah. They installed this at home. That's right. Here's your hip. A titanium hip. <laughs> But uh, the first thing, because you're so happy, Jen, and then the EGC on my uh, four seconds later, I was like, oh, no, it's the EGC part. <laughs> you weren't picking up what I was putting down. Uh, there's Merv. Perfect. Hi, Merv. Welcome back. All right, guys. Uh, so this is a very interesting email. I just want to touch on a couple of things. Um, the The whole sleep cabin as opposed to RV, um, obvious, I'm just, I'm doing this for our, our spectators, not necessarily for council, but of course a sleep cabin, uh, or a, we only allow one dwelling per lot in Bonashir Valley, and we do not consider a sleep cabin a dwelling, uh, whereas RVs are not considered dwelling under the Building Act, uh, and therefore that's, that's why that's a bit confusing. Um, but I like his number three, where he's saying there's confusion around the conditions. That's exactly what Jack and Tim were just speaking to. Um, you know, I, that's where I think there needs to be more clarity. Um, so he's offering to form a small group. Obviously, I mean, we're not voting on this today anyway. Um, would it be in our best interest to perhaps uh, table this to our second meeting in March, or in, sorry, in April. Oh, maybe it'll be really nice weather by then. Um, table this to the uh, end of April and ask Mr. O'Brien if he would just facilitate um, some quick discussion over the next month uh, and, and not let it go past that. I know that that, that puts a lot of uh, demand on a volunteer um, but if Mr. O'Brien felt that he could do that, then perhaps we might have uh, an even better bylaw being fleshed out um, to, to speak to everything that all five of us have said today. Um, I don't think that there's any harm in it. I don't think that we need to be involved in it. In fact, I think we should actually not be involved in it. I think that this should be, um, you know, a group of people that, that, you know, he will choose some from either side. Um, that that also want to see some compromise and uh, and definitely to to make perhaps the bylaw a little more user friendly, a little more readable, um, because as he states and as Tim and Jack were just talking about it and actually Brent, you said it as well. You want to go back to the primary document.
but it's it's not very user friendly. So uh, I'm just wondering, is this something that we would like uh, to do or do we just want to table this to our next uh, community meeting and discuss it then? Yes, Brent, go ahead. Well, I guess I guess uh, my my biggest my biggest Kurt, I, I don't mind if people want to put more um, uh, time and insight. That's why uh, I think it was December 16th meeting is when we actually released this bylaw and when we gave the notice out for the uh, for the next zoning meeting. So I guess people have had uh, three months to figure it out uh, plus another five years to either put in their input the recommendations and I, and like I I just don't know how much more time to offer especially uh, to one individual I, I'm all for volunteers and people uh, wanting to put things together um, and facilitate between two sides uh, but I just don't want to see this keep dragging uh, down and down and then we're going to get farther uh, down the road like I have no problem if we want to extend it uh, we can speak it to at the next meeting and see if there's any movement towards it um, I guess my, the thing is, is how many of the voices of the 181 are really um, people are going to uh, speak with? Um, so like who's going to be chosen to uh, speak on both sides or whatnot? I, I don't know. It's, I have no problem with it, but if, the, if, if this was to be successful, I guess it should have been done three months ago when the initial bylaw came out or five years ago when people started bringing, uh, when it started out as a neighborly dispute. Uh, so I just don't, I, I don't know. I don't know the individual. He seems like a really nice guy. He presented very well. Um, I think he could be a great facilitator for it. Um, I just don't know. I just don't want to see this keep getting pushed down. Um, the Pushed down uh, the calendar year, I guess, is my biggest concern. So if it can get done or they have an alternative they want to reach, but I, I'm perfectly happy with how the bylaw is written. Um, and if we do, but if we do want to ask, maybe your CBO to put in recommendations for more clarifications on really what uh, is a structure. People can't uh, comprehend like the definition of re recreational vehicle is, or what actually is the capacity of a permanently affixed uh, recreational vehicle. Then we can ask, I'm sure we can find online what an example is and we can have a list of examples. Um, but I guess that would be really in the faith of the CBO. I just don't know what, uh, what we're, what we're looking for in this group. Uh, for clarifying for details that I guess we could come up with for the next meeting? Well, to answer two of your questions, um, number one, I think Mr. O'Brien just recognized um, the divisiveness and actually the split down the middle um, where he he's willing to, to help sort of facilitate a conversation and maybe uh, calm some concerns. Um, you know, as I, I agree with Tim that I don't think that this is going to be a Mad Max of, you know, dumping trailers on every lot. I don't, I don't see that. And I, I agree that I, you know, one of his comments was that, um, you know, people love Lake Clear and, and they don't want to see degradation of Lake Clear. I don't believe that, that, you know, these stewards of Lake Clear, I don't, I don't see them. Um, wanting to destroy their environment. Uh, and I absolutely do not want to kick this down the road. So that's why I'm saying if this could be done um, by our second meeting in April, um, then at that point, then we can, uh, we can come back to it at committee. Tim, did you have your hand up? Yeah, I, I, I think if we have to clarify some definitions, um, we've received multiple, and I mean, not that I don't want information, but we have in the past received so much information on both sides of this equation. It, 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 there comes a point where we do have to make a decision and I would much rather do it sooner than later. And I'm not trying to say no to anybody's advice or their help or anything like that, but there are a lot of important things to do in Bonisher Valley, a lot of things going on and a lot of things coming down the pipe. And I think the more we spend adding this around, the more it might take from something else. So um, if you want to let them, let him do something on a, on a very small timeline, I'm okay with that, but I really don't want to see this go any further. And um, I would have, you know, I would have preferred to wrap it up today myself personally, but if everybody else needs a little more time, um, I oh. can say I, I'm fine with the, with, with the uh, bylaw. And uh, if we need to put clarifications and such into it, that's fine too. But uh, the sooner the better. Uh, sorry, I should have made myself more clear. 
uh, a bylaw cannot be passed at a public meeting. It has to be passed at council. No, oh, that's fine. Like I say, I and this is and that's what I'm saying. If we need to add more clarification to some of our definitions, I'm fine with that. But for the gist of it, and the meat and potatoes, I'm happy with what we've come to. Okay, uh, Merv, did you have your hand up? Yeah, I, I have no problem. He's free. And if you want to come back to the second meeting in April with some recommendations, that's fine with me. And Jack, what do you think? Um, that's uh, maybe he can bring some clarity to the people that have their, uh, they don't seem to understand it. So maybe by spending some time with these individuals, the clear, their, their questions can be brought forward so that we can clarify them and then change whatever we have to uh, the appropriate wording so people are fully understanding what's going on, i.e. either an RV or a structure or something that's hardscaped or not hardscaped, whatever. Uh, people have, all have their own interpretation of what I think they're classing hardscape as. So I think, as Brent touched on, I think we have to get a uh, mark to maybe hammer that clarification a little more if we have to put it somehow in, in, in the bylaw that this is what constitutes a hardscape. This is what constitutes an RV, which is just a vehicle, and that's and that's the way it is. So people are not jumping to conclusions, and I think I think that's where most of this most of the misunderstanding is. So if if that can be done in short order, I agree with Tim. This has to be hammered out. If if he can come back with something by the second week in April, then we can dis then discuss it at committee, and then our our first uh, council meeting in May, we can uh, pass it or whatever. You know what I mean? That's the sort of timeline I'm looking at. That was the, the exact timeline I was talking about. Exact timeline. Second meeting in April, hammer it out at committee. First meeting of uh, council in May, that gives our staff the ability to, to flesh that out. Now there is some of that in the bylaw about what constitutes, but it's, it's not clear, clear. So I, I think that that uh, definitely there needs to be some some massaging. Yes, Brent, go ahead. Uh, no, I said I was going to say I agree with what Jack had stated. And at end of the day, I, I think we just have to remind ourselves that we're the ones that uh, we just listened to about 186 letters. That uh, um, yes, we're going to we're agreeing to listen to a, a new, I guess, committee you would call it. They're going to try to mediate both sides. But at the end of the day, like that's almost what exactly we, we just did. And we've been doing is we just listened to three months worth of letters um, and it all comes down to our decision. And when it comes to, I guess, this mediated group, um, we're really narrowing it down to how, how is that uh, group designated? And are we going to listen to, I guess, seven people in a room versus the 180? Um, and I'm going to take it with, I guess you would say a small grain of salt in some aspects in the sense that I, I, I listened, I, I read through or the 180 some letters we got, uh, but end of the day, the decision is, is for us, uh, but I'm willing to wait until the second week of April for us or the second meeting of April for us to discuss it further. And, uh, with the gentleman's help, um, please more information sometimes is the better, but the decision end of the day, uh, we have had a lot of input on it as well. Thank you for that. Um, I just, one of the deficiencies of course, with a public meeting is that it isn't a debate and it doesn't include, um, you know, people batting around different ideas that they can do at sort of a small subcommittee. Um, am I saying that we're going to take every recommendation no, we probably won't. But I still think that, uh, you know, when we're offered something like this, uh, even though time is sort of of the essence, uh, it can't be passed today. It's not going to be passed at the next meeting because we haven't come to a consensus about lot size or anything else. Uh, it seems to me that three of us want to delineate some sort of uh, um, lot size and two do not. So I'm not sure, like, even if we wanted to, we couldn't pass this bylaw at our next meeting. So why not give this um, this uh, this gener generous offer uh, from a volunteer to just maybe help us facilitate a conversation? Because again, 
public meetings do not allow for debate between council and the letter writers. And I mean, I'm sure I, I watched your faces, uh, except for Tim, but I could feel Tim through the phone. Um, I watched your faces while the letters were being read. Everybody was very professional. You know, nobody, nobody rolled their eyes or anything else. We sat, we listened, but I guarantee there wasn't one of the five of us that at one point didn't want to jump in and say, that is incorrect, or that is unfair, or please don't call those people that name and those people that name. I know I did, and every time I did, I made a note because I know the rules of a public meeting, and I think that this, this whatever you want to call it, little subcommittee, it certainly couldn't hurt. I mean, I, I'm all about taking help from people, and this has been a long slog and I'd love to get it done now. Yes, Tim. No, uh, you know, Jen, you, you're absolutely right. I, I did hear a lot of things and uh, while I was listening, you know, I would have loved to have been able to say, you know, <laughs> that's definitely not what, what, what we're trying to, to do or, or at least I'm, what, what I'm not trying to do, you know, we're, we're, we're definitely not making a free for all we, we, we all, as far as I'm concerned, we all care about every bit of Bonisher Valley to the, to the fullest. Uh, we don't want to see, you know, any kind of anarchy going on like some of the letters suggested that might just happen here in the future. Um, no, and I mean, it, 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 for myself too, it, it was a little bit, you know, emotional hearing what was going on and what was not being said at the time, not emotional, but you understand what I mean. There was a lot of stuff there where, I would have liked to have been able to interject and correct on that point. Um, so, so, you know, yeah, it, it, it's not going to hurt. I, I'd like to see the timeline be kept as short as possible, but absolutely right. We do need clarification if there was that type of misinformation, even within the letters. So I think that's where we are maybe lacking. Um, it, if there was so much, you know, where we're sitting here listening and saying, you know, you're wrong because that shouldn't be the case when it comes to a bylaw issue because they should be able to read the bylaw and they should be able to understand the bylaw. And if we've got to bring it forward where we've got to provide a little more clarity on what we are all trying to get out there, so be it. But I would, I love the idea that Jack put forward about you know coming to a conclusion there in May, uh, let's get this done. And, and that's what I meant earlier, let's get this done because you know, for, frankly, we, we've had a lot of information put forward and it definitely, you know, um, I've considered so many options in the last few years about, you know, what, what we're doing and what we're not. And just remember, no matter what we do, guys, somebody's going to be mad. And it's just the way, the way it is, right? So uh, I, I'm always just going to try and do the right thing for everyone. That's all. We're never going to please everybody. And this, again, is a divisive issue. Uh, but Tim, I don't disagree with your word emotional. At some points, I was kind of like, don't, don't badmouth either side. You have your opinion and that's your opinion. And we're all entitled to our own opinions. Uh, and I certainly, once again, did not appreciate the personal slams on this council. Um, you know, I think that all five of us work very hard for the good of all of Bonashir Valley. Um, you know, I always joke and, and Brent and I have, have joked a few times about this, that um, every household in Bonashir Valley pays each of you $5 a year and uh, pays me $6 a year. Yes, I'm, I'm way overpaid. That is per household per year, not per week, not per month, per year. And, uh, you know, I think that we work very hard, not that any of us got into this for the money, um, but but we uh, we certainly took it on the chin today, um, and uh, in in some cases was not warranted. Uh, I do not uh, like name calling. I personally don't do it, and uh, and so I was quite insulted. So when you use the word emotional, you're not wrong. Um, thanks for those words. Go ahead, Merv. Yeah. And in conclusion, I I hope we can come to a compromise. I hope this gentleman can come to a compromise. I don't want to see us dragged into a legal challenge. I mean, I remember freshly in my mind, not that many years ago, 
There was another dispute on Lake Huyer, and we got sucked into an OMB hearing, which cost the taxpayer just thousand fifty dollars to sixty thousand dollars. If we can help, we don't need to go through that again. Let's hope we can come up to a compromise. Thanks, Merv. All right, so um, that it's uh, five to three. Yes, and that I was just <clears throat> I was actually going to turn it over to you. Um, so, um, with your indulgence, would you mind um, responding to Mr. O'Brien and asking if that's a possibility and explaining, well, he heard today that it's been going on for five years. So, you know, he knows what he's getting into, but um, perhaps if we could just ask if that timeline would suffice. And I would say that although the township does not need to be involved, um, if uh, we could facilitate the um, a Zoom meeting for them, I think that would go a long way. I know that not everybody has, um, you know, Zoom accounts. So if that's something that uh, we ask who's got one, um, then that's uh, that's great. Okay. So that would be for the April 16th meeting. We would like the, the or April 16th, April 20th meeting. We want the recommendations back for. Yes, please. Okay. Because that gives yeah. us, that gives us, and if he wants to come as a delegation, that would be fine. And then, sorry, I don't know who's chairing that meeting. Maybe I shouldn't have offered that up. Um, but if he wants to come as a delegation, then that gives us some time in the afternoon to discuss a couple of weeks to revise and uh, the first meeting of May uh, council, um, we can pass. Okay, and uh, well, no, so that's what I wanted to, to oh, no, clarify is that if we make any changes to this bylaw, we have to go through the public meeting again under the Planning Act. So we have to do a 20 day notice period. We have to do a 20 day appeal period. So um, if there are any changes made to this bylaw, it is a three month process. So I just wanted to be clear with that for everybody listening and for council, uh, that is the timeline that we're looking at. So that that's what I was sort of, yeah. Thanks. My bad, I know better. This, this day has gone on too long. I know better, sorry. Yes, Brent. And then just to clarify, we'll have another 186 letters to read again. We may, but I think we're going to be more clear in our notice that we are going to read the comments that are di directly uh, impact the bylaw, and we're not going to get into a lot of, um, you know, personal and family and that kind of detail, because I think that ate up a lot of time, and I don't know how effective that was in sort of addressing the concerns and the options in the bylaw. So um, I'll work on some wording if that's where we end up, is, if yes, that's, that's uh, okay. okay with council. Annette and I had a very long conversation about uh, this after our February 16th meeting uh, because of the very personal nature of some of the letters and the slams on us and the slams on either side. And so, yeah, we can, we can certainly word um, the public meeting uh, report more appropriately perhaps for this particular initiative. And I would say that it would we would only be entertaining letters that would speak to the changes, not to what has previously been said. So I, I think that that will certainly quell that. But why don't we leave this with Mr. O'Brien? Uh, let's see where he lands. Um, and, you know, at the very least, guys, um, everybody here wants um, Mark to sort of interject and help with some wording. So no matter what, we are changing this bylaw one way or another, right? We, we all want it fleshed out a little bit by Mark. So it's, it's gonna have to come back no matter what. All right, is there anything else? I see none. All right, guys. Well, I guess I will conclude this meeting. I hope you all have a great weekend. Get out and enjoy the beautiful uh, sunshine. Jack, good luck with the dam. Uh, very exciting that you got those parts. Um, I hope everybody uh, gets some relaxation time. I know it's been a long week for all of us and uh, I miss you awesome nerds and we will, uh, we will talk soon. Um, Annette, did you need anything else from us? Awesome, all right guys. See ya.